Good afternoon to everybody, uh, to our dear colleagues and friends, and above all, our external speakers. I would like to wish you a warm welcome to this debate on the Hungarian Constitution. It's a great pleasure that we can welcome so distinguished speakers to discuss about uh, an issue that uh, has caused uh, quite some debate over the last few months in Hungary as well over Europe. Everybody has been reading in the newspapers and listening and reading the sometimes warm debates about uh, warm, not to say hot debates about uh, what's, uh, what's happening in, in Hungary. My former colleagues from the European Parliament, Joseph uh, Sayer from the Popular Party, and in spite of that, a good friend, and Zita Gurmai from the Socialist Party, and in spite of that, a good friend, uh, as well as Gabor Halmai and Andreas Jakab, are experts in the topics from both the point of view of uh, academic approach and political approach. So I want to really thank you to come here because I know that you have just arrived and you will leave immediately after finishing this debate. This is not a way of coming to Firenze, you know. <laughs> this should be forbidden to go into the city and just stay a few hours. You should stay during the weekend and enjoy this beautiful Tuscany sun and this beautiful place. So I hope you will come back with more time. I want also to congratulate the head of our SPS department, Prosefa Brutz, by accident, Hungarian. By accident. Just by accident. <laughs> Hopefully not by accident. Uh, and our <laughs> IWUDO, as European Union Democracy Observatory, who have uh, organized this event. As you all know, the new Hungarian constitution, which entered in force in January of this year, has caused a vast and controversial debate in the European policy-making realm, in academia, in the media. The drafting was uh, initiated in 2010 by the new government and succeeded the Hungarian constitution dated 1949. So it was quite a time to review the constitution. No? The proponents of the new constitution argue that uh, completed Hungarian's transition to a modern democracy, and that is a well-balanced constitution, avoiding mismanagement and financial trouble, which Hungary has been suffering in recent years. Critics, on the other hand, argue that the new constitution removes crucial checks on government powers, and that it was shaped in the interest of the government of the Fidesz party. In Hungary, there were huge demonstrations against the new constitutions and many parties and interest groups raised their concern. The concern was also sent at the international level. The European Commission launched legal challenges against Hungary because it suspects the constitution violated the EU law and the independence of the National Central Bank and the judicial system. Even the European Parliament had the visit of the Hungarian Prime Minister, and I know you had a very interesting debate about that. So I think this is something that in this institution, in this university, which were, was created to, to, to study and to do research about the, the problems of the constructing Europe and how the supranational democracy is being built and how do we respect human rights and freedom of expression, political freedom, in all European countries could not, could not uh, avoid having a debate about that. I think that it would be missing part of our mission if we were not paying an attention to this event. Now things that, uh, it seems that things are a little bit more calm than a couple of months ago. It seems that there are some agreement, some better understanding of what's going on, I think the presence of the Hungarian Prime Minister of the European Parliament was an important step in order to the convergence of point of views. But here we have privileged protagonists of this issue. And the Institute is very happy and very thankful to you to give us the opportunity to our researchers and professors of learning more 
about this topic and participating in this debate about one important issue of the political life in Europe. I want to thank the representative of the Hungarian Embassy in Rome, who is here with us, also professors from the uh, Siena University and people from the civil society from Firenze who are accompanying us in this debate. And now I think I have to give the floor to you, Laszlo. Okay, take the floor and conduct the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, we, are, uh, we came together to discuss the Hungarian constitution, uh, but uh, of course uh, we will not have time to go uh, into uh, many of the questions uh, uh, that uh, might be raised. So we will focus uh, on four, at the most uh, five uh, issues that are most uh, contested and most debated uh, that are linked to the Hungarian constitution. Uh, uh, I mentioned just four of them, and hopefully uh, we will have time to discuss uh, uh, all of them, and then, also, of course, several others might come up uh, uh, during the debate. The first uh, 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 of the questions that is most uh, very much debated uh, is the necessity, the justification for the new constitution. Uh, uh, the proponents of this uh, new constitution, or basic law, as it is called, uh, uh, claim that uh, the new constitution ends uh, the regime change and it uh, heralds the starting of the consolidation uh, of the new regime. Uh, according uh, to the opponents uh, of uh, this constitution, this was a unilateral constitution making, uh, uh, was opposed by uh, all the other parliamentary parties uh, and instead of serving the stabilization and consolidation uh, of uh, democracy, it makes the constitution the major target of political struggles for the coming years or perhaps decades. So instead of uh, uh, stabilizing, it becomes a means of destabilizing uh, uh, the regime. But the other question that is uh, hotly debated uh, is uh, itself the process uh, of making this constitution. Uh, the proponents uh, 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 say that uh, this was uh, uh, and they refer on a broad-based uh, political uh, debates preceding the constitution making uh, and often refer to the extraordinary situation uh, uh, to justify uh, the frequent use of constitutional amendments and of uh, 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 several uh, uh, other aspects of the constitution. Opponents uh, uh, talk about uh, fake political participation and uh, 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 fake channels of political participation in this process uh, and challenge uh, the legitimacy of constitution making. Then uh, there are uh, basic issues and very important debates uh, uh, about the protection of fundamental rights, uh, separation of powers, uh, while uh, uh, according to the opponents, uh, the, the proponents of this uh, constitution, this uh, constitution gives uh, uh, enough guarantees uh, to uh, basic freedoms uh, and uh, strong defenses to uh, separation of powers. Opponents uh, uh, say that it weakens uh, uh, all of that uh, uh, weakens the defense of uh, the protection of uh, fundamental rights, uh, uh, dramatically weakens the separation of powers and undermines uh, judicial autonomy. Uh, there is a fourth question that is hotly debated uh, uh, by the opponents uh, and proponents of this constitution. Uh, this refers to uh, democratic governance. Uh, uh, according to the uh, proponents of this uh, constitution, uh, the new basic law strengthens uh, the room for uh, democratic governance, while according to the opponents of this crisis, uh, it basically dramatically weakens uh, the room for uh, the democratic governance, uh, entrenching the political preferences of a single party uh, by different means. So these are uh, uh, some of the basic questions. There are several others uh, 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 that might uh, come up. Uh, what uh, we are going to do in this uh, brief time uh, First, I will just briefly in introduce uh, uh, the participants of the debate, and then we will go on some of these questions. Hopefully, there will be time also for uh, asking questions, uh, also for the audience. Uh, uh, let me introduce uh, the members of the panels. On my right, uh, 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 Josef Sarr, uh, who is uh, seen as one of the fathers uh, of the new constitution. He was uh, uh, the chair of the committee uh, that prepared uh, uh, the new constitution. Uh, he is a founding member of the Fidesz uh, 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 party. He has been involved in the Hungarian constitution making basically since uh, 1989, 
us first as a member of the opposition roundtable and the member of the committee that discussed uh, the Hungarian uh, constitution uh, of uh, constitutional changes uh, of 1989, and then uh, later uh, uh, he participated in several different ways in constitution making. He is the vice chair of the European Parliament's center-right uh, European People's Party. That's the largest political group uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, right uh, on the left uh, from uh, our president is Zita Vurmai, also member of the European Parliament, uh, who is member of the Socialist Party, Hungarian Socialist Party. She uh, became a vice chair of the Socialist International in 1999, and then she was also still vice chair of the Socialist International uh, between 2003 and 2008. And uh, she has been the member of the European Parliament since uh, 2004, and currently she is the vice chair uh, on the Committee on Constitutional Affairs uh, of the European Parliament. Uh, then uh, uh, to the extreme right, uh, or to the right from me, I'm sorry, uh, is Andras Jakob, Professor Andras Jakob. He is a, a real constitutional lawyer, uh, teaching uh, uh, as a Schumpeter Fellow uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and <coughs> International Law and Heidelberg, and to the extreme left, or two times from left, is uh, Professor Gabor Halmai, also a constitutional lawyer, uh, who is director of the Institute uh, of the Political and International Studies uh, uh, in Budapest, and recently he is a visiting uh, professor at uh, Princeton, uh, teaching uh, comparative uh, uh, constitutional law. So uh, we have really a distinguished uh, group uh, of uh, scholars and politicians. Uh, and uh, the first round, in the first round, uh, I would like to ask uh, each uh, member of the panel, just briefly, uh, in two, three minutes, just tell uh, what he or she thinks are the key vices or virtues uh, of the Constitution. And after that round, we will get to these questions that uh, uh, I have uh, briefly highlighted. So why don't we start? from this direction. Thank you very much. I think the most important point in a constitutional democracy is always the situation of the constitutional court. And uh, is it better like this? Okay, okay. So once again, I think the most important issue in a constitutional democracy is the situation of the constitutional court. And we can discuss many issues about the new new constitution but i think the also in hungary that's that's the key issue to understand the the situation and here i think there is a there's a major problem which we cannot deny and that is that the competences of the constitutional court uh, are limited now the hungarian constitutional court cannot review any statutes on taxes uh, budgetary or financial issues except for if it's uh, if it's in breach of uh, some fundamental rights like the right to life, right to human dignity, uh, right to the freedom of religion, right to privacy, but these are typically not those rights which are threatened by by tax legislation. Uh, most importantly, the the right to the uh, to property is not not enlisted. So. I think that's that's one issue which uh, which is very difficult to to defend uh, from the point of view of constitutionalism and uh, other issues of the constitutional court which we're going to discuss definitely later like the the new new competences instead of actio popularis we have a traditional constitutional complaint i don't have any problems with that but this this is a, an issue which uh, which, which is a serious one, and uh, which uh, puts some shadow on the on the new constitution. But except for that, even though there are other parts of the constitution with which I don't agree, uh, the other parts, which I don't find uh, fortunate, can be corrected through means of interpretation by the constitutional court if it takes its task seriously, which we hope it will. So very shortly, that would be. Thank you very much, uh, President, and uh, my colleague uh, Zita knows that in the European Parliament we have uh, 
Normally, the, our speaking time doesn't exceed two minutes, so if you are a very high official, you can speak three or four minutes, and once I had five minutes, but that doesn't mean that we can speak short. That means that we have the opportunity to speak longer because we are not under this constraint then we tend to be uh, endlessly long. But anyway, <laughs> as, as an introduction, you introduced me as a, as a father of this, or one of the fathers of this uh, constitution. I would claim myself rather a stepfather uh, because I'm not a legislator. I am uh, in a completely different parliament. I'm in the European Parliament, so I was not voting on this constitution. I was just the chair of the committee which was drafting the original text and then parliament in the normal democratic process was taking over and um, adopting in the, uh, in the constitution according to the rules laid down by the previous constitution uh, in a procedural way. Um, I'm welcoming the somewhat unexpected interest uh, in Europe and in the whole world in some of the newspapers uh, and, uh, and even uh, telejournalists uh, of this uh, new constitution because uh, I think, uh, and uh, despite of uh, some of the some of the voices in Hungary, I think that uh, it's good for Europe in general to discuss uh, some of the basic uh, principles of democracy together with us. It also could reflect in a healthy stage uh, a good uh, new phase of uh, European democracy that we are trying to compare and discuss uh, some of the elements of the Hungarian constitution. However, I would like to make a caveat here, which is clearly about <coughs> that when you are speaking and when we are speaking, and I'm not meaning, meaning the panel here, but uh, some of the uh, bombastic uh, headlines of some of the newspapers uh, in early January, then uh, first read uh, rather the text and then the newspaper headlines, uh, because they could be very misleading. Uh, the, uh, the debates which the journalists uh, and uh, many of the debate is claiming in the public sphere in Europe, which were missing so far, and this is why I'm stressing how important it is that we have an all-European debate about political uh, things uh, as well, uh, that um, uh, is, uh, is not much about the Hungarian constitution itself and not about the text. Uh, and if you read the text, then you will see it, what I mean. Uh, because uh, uh, because uh, what is what the debates are uh, partly not related uh, uh, directly to the text of the constitution itself, but rather a very unique uh, political situation which comes from the fact that uh, uh, the governing party has a uh, 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 has a unprecedented uh, uh, two-third majority in the national parliament, which uh, which is a const which is conducting basically a constitutional majority. And in Europe is the exception of Bavaria, I don't think, which is not having the same powers of uh, making a national constitution, but uh, with the exception of Bavaria, there hasn't been such a political uh, situation arising. So there is a um, naturally born feeling that uh, the world have to replace the weak and splittered opposition in Hungary um, by pressing uh, and playing the role of the checks and balances of a national role. But um, since the constitution and constitution making is a uh, genuinely sovereign act uh, of a national, uh, national uh, legislation or a, a country, uh, this raises some, uh, uh, some collateral, however very serious problems. Uh, which, is, uh, which is dealing, which has been faced uh, several bodies, like for instance, the very well respected Venice Commission, uh, who is reviewing constitutions, especially for the new countries, uh, uh, and doing uh, work on that on the Council of Europe or the European Parliament or other international bodies are facing uh, when uh, you are getting into a national debate uh, on specific things where there, is, there are constitutional traditions. Uh, whether your judgments are really the same as it would be in a national debate. And my last point is uh, just addressing this problem of two-third majority. Um, in a Hungarian electoral system, to get two-third majority is borders impossible. In a British system, that would mean that uh, the present governing party would have 173 uh, seats uh, and two seats for the socialist opposition <coughs> and one independent. Uh, that really is something which is creating, I mean, it's a clear significance that people wanted some change. And they, dis uh, they discarded the previous political uh, powers. 
so that's what we say, and that's my last sentence, that uh, my party was not winning this two-third majority on lottery, but on a very deeply rooted uh, desire for change of a defunct, uh, partly defunct uh, constitutional, uh, but also legal system uh, of the country. Uh, and what, they, what, what, is, what it is doing is basically doing this restructuring, this very thorough uh, desire which has been expressed in the elections. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to sit uh, to next my president of the European uh, Parliament. And of course, as uh, we belong to the same party family, of course, when I came to the plane, I guess I met some called Catalans and okay, hugs and kisses, so it's really good to be here. And of course, we meet sometimes in some places of, of the world, and of course, I was really very pleased to, to come here. And actually, I can tell you there was no mother for the Constitution, because I haven't seen any woman who was dealing with it. Of course, I don't want to say that I was the mother, because I was not, and actually, I wouldn't be a mother, because this Constitution is not from 1949, it's, uh, it's from 19... Uh, 18, I, they didn't change the number, uh, thank you very much, uh, by, the, by the way. And of course, uh, can you imagine a communist country entering the European Union if it would be true? So I, I, I have serious doubt. And of course, don't forget that we, we needed to harmonize, uh, uh, of course, before entering to the, to the European Union. And if I'm not mistaken, it was, it was Mr. Jakob who really tried to, to update as a, as, a, as, a, as a good constitution, uh, if I am not mistaken. So he really did a research on, on that. Uh, on, on that time. So I believe that uh, that was a, a Eurocompan constitution, I would say. Okay, so the general problems, as I see, uh, of, of the adoption, uh, lack of consensus, lack of consultation, questionable support of the majority of the electorate, and of course the question, if the new constitution is a so-called nation will, uh, one could ask the question, why has not the nation been asked about its own will? So that is my, that is my question. And of course, uh, my, my questions and problems uh, uh, for uh, future government, uh, how areas which traditionally depend on the government areas now set in the fundamental law or in, in so-called cardinal uh, laws as well, requiring uh, two-third majority, but two-third majority is not three-third majority. And of course, uh, what does two-third majority mean? 52.73% uh, of the voters, and that is 34% of, uh, of those who are entitled to vote. So I think it's also very important just to see how, how it looks in, uh, in, in uh, reality, uh, I would say. And of course, um, as a member of the current uh, democratic uh, opposition, of course, uh, my party, MSP, uh, you, can, you cannot ignore this. And of course, uh, elections uh, might lose their importance, putting democracy in, in question, and, and future government won't be able to govern efficiently. Uh, and of course, uh, the reason why all of us had the possibility to, to, to deal with, with questions, of course, uh, my special area, and of course, I was very active in the Women's Rights Committee, being the president of the European Socialist Party Women Organization, and of course, the reason why I'm wearing this, uh, this badge, my body, my rights, because uh, concerning the Constitution, it takes a different care of, uh, of uh, women's rights, uh, I would say, than than, than the former or the, or the comp uh, to progressive government. And of course, uh, what is also very important to take into consideration that we really wanted to have a debate uh, in the Constitutional Committee, and unfortunately we couldn't have it just after uh, uh, we had uh, the, the vote in the Hungarian parliament uh, on the 18th of uh, April. Actually, that was 19th of April, so the day after when we could have a debate. And, and actually, uh, the question of the president uh, of uh, the Constitutional Committee, Mr. Cassini, uh, who is uh, Italian conservative, by the way, uh, he asked the question whether that was in the election campaign of Fidesz that uh, they, they announced for, for, for the voters that they, they have a plan to, to, to deal with a type of uh, new uh, constitution. And of course, uh, what is also important that uh, although drafting a, a new constitution is a prerogative of individual member states, and of course it cannot be an entirely uh, private matter on the given member states as the European Union is a community based on, on common values, uh, I would say. And of course, uh, concerning, concerning the independence uh, of the judiciary, because that's uh, what I found uh, extremely interesting. Judicial independence is an old principle of Hungarian public law, Article 15 of Act 4 of 1869, ensured the independence of judges through the prohibition of 
precocious removal from the office. And that time the reti retirement age was 70. So I'm wondering that we live much longer nowadays, why we have to reduce this age 70 uh, into 60, uh, 62. But of course, uh, I'm sure that we have, uh, we have other very good cash questions on, on this issue we should, we should uh, uh, debate uh, as well. And I believe that four weeks debate for, for a new constitution was not uh, enough. I was wondering, it was because uh, we had to be ready by the Easter. Uh, and of course, uh, just to talk about we as nation, uh, I believe that I'm the one third and I don't feel myself as a nation, as a part of it. And I also would like to remind ourselves, if we did with Cardinal Knows as well, of course we had a good example in France uh, some, some time ago, uh, then they tried to make a quick constitution, but after that there was a referendum and, and French people voted 80% for this constitution. So that's what uh, I believe, that if, if we don't have a referendum, then, then I believe the constitution is excellent, when quiet comes after. And, and I was deeply shocked. Meanwhile, we had a very good Hungarian presidency concerning the very good topics, economic governments. I'm very, very proud that, uh, that the Hungarian government did an excellent job at colleagues all around. But nobody knows because we dealt with the Hungarian constitution and, and, and with the media freedom. So that is a pity that we started to deal with this issue at that time. Meanwhile, I would say Roma issue or the Danube issue and, and so many other issues were very important. I am concentrating on finishing. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm really honored and have the pleasure to be here. Uh, First of all, I agree with, with Joseph Sayer that, that uh, this is a good occasion for, for the entire Europe to discuss the, the principles of the European Union and the principles of a member state's constitution within that union. Uh, reading the text of the Hungarian constitution actually many times, uh, I dare to say that this Hungarian constitution does not comply with Article 2 of the European Union, with, with those principles uh, of Article 2, rule of law, democracy, uh, guaranteed fundamental rights. Let me very shortly uh, make statements of, of these uh, issues. Probably later on I, I will have the chance to, to prove my, my very, very uh, uh, short statements. Uh, the first statement, uh, which is actually uh, was not my intention to, to, to say, but uh, our president's words that, that the Hungarian constitution <coughs> is, the, the old Hungarian constitution is from, from 1949. Uh, you have to know that after the transition in uh, 1989 and 1990, uh, this constitution from 49 was comprehensively amended. Some even argue that only one sentence remained uh, in force from the 49 constitution, namely that the capital of Hungary is Budapest, nothing else. This uh, 89 constitution was a full-fledged liberal constitution with guaranteed separation of power, with guaranteed fundamental rights and the necessary institutions. These are no uh, uh, at risk by this new constitution. And uh, I also have to emphasize that we are, I'm not talking about only on the constitution itself, which was uh, enacted in April last year. I'm talking about the whole, whole constitutional order uh, and especially on those so-called cardinal laws, which were enacted uh, mostly in the very end of, of last year. The constitution uh, prescribes uh, uh, around 50 different topics, which are due to uh, regulated by, by the so-called cardinal laws uh, voted with two-third majority. So, Separation of power. Uh, I guess that the already mentioned uh, shortcomings and, and uh, uh, curtailments of the constitutional competences 
are one of the aspects of, of this lack of separation of, of power. I have to also add to that curtailment of the competencies, which actually means for constitutional scholars that the primacy of the constitution is not present in the new constitution, since there can be laws which, are, which can be uh, uh, unconstitutional without any possibility of reviewing that laws on financial uh, economic issues. But additionally, the, not only the competences are curtailed in that constitution, but the, the constitutional court was packed. Uh, seven new constitutional court judges were elected since the elections in, in spring 2010. All of these seven constitutional court uh, justices were nominated by the governing party. All of them, some, some of them not even fulfilled the, uh, the legal requirements being a constitutional court judge, and all of them loyalist to the governing party. Uh, the, the ju judiciary, as, as was already mentioned, is not independent. The head of the judiciary is a close friend to the, to the prime minister. She has the right to, to uh, uh, nominate all of the judges later on uh, details. Uh, we, we can talk about the presidency. The, the newly elected president uh, is, a, is a former uh, member of the governing party who in the last uh, 20 months had turned no, zero law, uh, neither to the parliament nor to the constitutional court, although he has this, this power. Fundamental rights. Uh, let me mention only two, two rights, very important rights. The already mentioned media law. We have a new media regulation body consisting exclusively loyalist to the governing party. Uh, freedom of religion. Uh, the, the new uh, law on, on the churches deregistered about uh, 300 registered, already registered churches. And uh, the parliament, which decides on, on the registration of the new registration of churches, uh, registered some, some new churches. Altogether, uh, about 30 new churches are now registered. There is no remedy for that parliamentary decision. This is a, a totally discretionary power of the parliament to register churches. And finally, uh, democracy. I think that also the election, the new election law uh, enacted uh, in the very end of last year uh, provides such a benefit for the, for the governing party that according to some, some studies, with that, that new regulation and with the new gerrymandering system also introduced by the governing majority, the Fidesz would have won all of the elections which they lost in 2002 and in 2006. In 2006, they lost by, by a, a big margin. So uh, these are my, my short statement. I, I, uh, very much hope that I will have the, the time and possibility to prove them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will come back to uh, lots of this question. Instead of directly uh, uh, answering these questions, uh, uh, we turn to the first question. Again, uh, uh, the time uh, will be uh, brief to answer that, and then we can get uh, to debate later. So the first question, the most general question that uh, uh, we would like to uh, start with is the question whether there was a need for a new constitution in Hungary and uh, whether the new constitution making was uh, legitimate. This is a question that is uh, debated and uh, I think uh, we should go then the opposite order uh, uh, asking this question. This will be the first question. Again, uh, try to be brief, two, three yes. minutes. Uh, on the one hand, I have to admit that there was a need for a new constitution, definitely, in Hungary. The Hungarian uh, constitution-making process, which I already mentioned in 89-90, was a, a so-called post-sovereign uh, constitution-making process. This is, the, this is the definition of Andrew Areto, my, my good friend at New School, uh, meaning that this uh, comprehensive amendment I already mentioned was prepared by an illegitimate body of, of the round table, 
where none of the participants uh, were legitimately elected. The one, one side was the, the governing uh, uh, Communist Party, the other side were the opposition parties who were not democratically elected. So, and as this uh, uh, amendment was, was voted by the, by the previous Communist uh, uh, Parliament. So it needed a new legitimate constitution, it's no question about that. Uh, and the Hungarian parliament unfortunately failed to, to, to finalize this constitution making process. There was a, a serious attempt in, in 1996, but this, this failed. So we needed a new constitution. Uh, I already tried to, tried to explain why this constitution is not that constitution we needed to finalize. Uh, and on the legitimacy. Uh, it was already, already mentioned by, by many that there were really serious sh shortcomings in the procedure of that new constitution making uh, process. The first shortcoming was that uh, the previous constitution uh, uh, entailed a regulation which said that the that the rule on a drafting of a new constitution needs a four-fives majority. It was in force until, until uh, June, if I remember correctly, or, or until July 2010. Then the governing uh, uh, majority, with its two-third majority, uh, changed that four-fifths majority requirement. Uh, I do not want to to go into details, what, what does it mean? Uh, there are also some, some legality problems of the new constitution, since some of the provisions, very important provisions, by the way, uh, uh, concerning, for instance, the independence of the judiciary. Uh, they reduced in the constitution the retirement age of, of, uh, age of judges from 70 to 61 with a constitutional regulation. This constitutional regulation was uh, submitted in the last minute without any discussion, without any possibility of discussion. By the way, this was the reason the Constitutional Court uh, uh, declared unconstitutional the, the first, first version of the Church's law, because it was, it was introduced such, such a, a way without allowing the, the uh, any kind of discussion. So these are the most important uh, things of that, that shortcomings of the legitimacy, uh, not to speak about the procedure which was altogether uh, nine days discussion uh, in the parliament without the participation of the opposition parties. And uh, one, more, one more minor thing, uh, after the submission of the, of the draft constitution by the, by the commission led by, by uh, Josef Steyer, but signed, of course, by, uh, by all of the MPs of the governing parties. After five days of that submission, the constitution was uh, uh, enacted. Thank you. So just to, to add, uh, okay, in general, the question needs to be, <coughs> I would say, more precise. Need expressed by whom? Uh, the relevant question uh, is if there was a need for the electorate, uh, electorate uh, to have a new constitution. And of course, uh, but that could have only been asserted by the way of a referendum, and I strongly believe that that was the so-called uh, instrument uh, as, uh, as our uh, Spanish uh, uh, friend, former prime minister, realized. And of course, that time, they created a, a, a commission of seven people, three of them from, for, were from the government and four of them for the opposition. And of course, there was a vote in the parliament, you get 96%, and then there was a referendum, which was also over 90%. So that is that is really very important when, when, when you really want to, to challenge uh, something new that you really need to know the will uh, of, uh, of uh, ordinary uh, citizens. Uh, and of course, uh, um, 
as we, we, we said, the parliamentary majority did not support it, the idea uh, asking uh, for their uh, electorate. Of course, uh, there was a questionnaire uh, in which uh, you, you got uh, some extremely uh, good questions, and, uh, and I understood that uh, one million uh, replied, and actually within three weeks, 140 people had to deal with this, you know, just to, just to, just to get uh, uh, the proper answers on that. But uh, let's see uh, what type of reaction we have, because I think it is very important to know at that time when we, we dealt with the constitution-making process, uh, uh, what, what uh, was the opinion of the Venice Commission, uh, what he found in its opinion, uh, that it is regulatable that the constitution-making process, including the drafting and the final adoption of the new constitution, has been affected by lack of transparency, shortcomings in the dialogue between the majority and the opposition, the un insufficient opportunities for an adequate public debate and the very tight uh, time frame, as, uh, as, as, uh, as Gabor also said. And I just would like to repeat that, of course, uh, such a speedy arrangement is not unprecedented. And, and I just would like to be more precise on, on what I said, that, uh, for example, the, the constitutional transition from the fourth to the fifth republic in France has been carried out in, in derogation from the dispositions of an old constitution uh, providing for its own revision. And I just, just would like to, be for, for historical reason, who were there, uh, De Gaulle, Michel Debris, and Ray Bourgeano. And of, of course, only three months uh, had passed between the first draft and the adoption of the text of the new constitution by the government. But however, uh, under that circumstances, it was clear that the Lophus is the democratic procedure could have only been reminded by a referendum. And that's why I believe then, when in, on the 27th of September 1958, almost 80% voted in favor for that constitution. This gave legitimacy for, for, uh, for the text. And of course, uh, I'm much more interested in whether uh, it was preceded by the necessary political, professional, scientific, and social debate, because I believe that when you prepare a new constitution, but by the Way, the constitution is not called any longer constitution, it calls new basic law, so we, we change the, the title or the, or the name as well. And of course, war is concerning the exclusion of the public and also uh, oppositional uh, political forces. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, professional, scientific, and other non-governmental uh, organizations uh, were expressed by the statement uh, of, uh, of the Venice uh, Committee of the European Council uh, passed on in plenary session on the 25th and the 20, 26th of, uh, 6th of March. And of course, uh, I believe uh, that uh, the new fundamental law was only supported by the governing party. And I just would like to remind uh, myself that uh, our former socialist uh, uh, spokesperson of the parliament uh, who, who, who really tried to help this procedure, uh, Katalin Silly, at the end, uh, I didn't find any of her amendments which was adopted in, in the new constitution. So poor colleague of former mine, you know, that she made a hard effort to make it and unfortunately uh, no success. So as a politician, I must say that uh, this was a strategic mistake uh, from, uh, from the governing uh, party. And I, st I still believe that uh, this constitution, uh, if, uh, if nowadays we could have a referendum on, it could, it could give a, a proper uh, approval uh, as uh, well. And of course, I just would like to, to mention that the far uh, right extreme uh, party, Jobbik, uh, has first participated in, uh, in the drafting of this text, but uh, then uh, chose the opt-out after uh, their amendments were, uh, were rejected. And this means that uh, that was only uh, the governing party who participated in the adoption of the new constitution. And of course, the democratic opposition uh, decided to refrain from taking part of the process uh, for, for various reasons. And of course, the adoption of a, of a new constitution F uh, fell on the period of the Hungarian presidency, as I, as I already mentioned. There was no political consensus on the need for and on the content uh, of the new constitution. And uh, what is also very important, that there was no consensus in, in, with the civil society about, uh, about the constitution. And in the election campaign, as I already mentioned, Fidesz had not mentioned it in its political program that uh, there is a type of uh, intention on that. And the preparation of the new constitution lagged any serious public uh, uh, consultation, trade unions, representative of organizations, and so on. And of course, uh, I just would like to repeat that the time frame for the adoption of the new constitution was extremely short compared with other European practice.
Um, thank you very much. Um, let's uh, start with the point uh, for the need for the new constitution is that uh, the basic principle of separation of powers and checks and balances has to be reestablished. In Hungary since 1990, and I agree with all those who Hungary had a constitutional background which was fully fledged uh, basis for a democratic country, but uh, there has been one very principal question which comes from the point of view of uh, the basic uh, idea of separation of powers, which is in my idea, I don't know whether the professor is explaining to the students differently, but uh, in my idea separation of powers is uh, when there are the different branches uh, of uh, government, judiciary, parliament, executive. In Hungary we have uh, in addition the public prosecutor and now we added uh, uh, even the management of the, uh, of the justice uh, and several others, the ombudsman. So there are the different uh, spheres of government which are separated from each other, which create the checks and balances which are creating uh, checks on each other. But on the classical theory of uh, Montesquieu, uh, there is a clear principle how it works. It works that the legislator is adopts the constitution or the, or the laws. So there, are, there, are, there is a text which is, on the other hand, interpreted by the other branch of the government, which is the judiciary. The judges have the right to interpret the laws. Uh, however, we have a long history in Europe and uh, as very especially uh, in countries where there are really basic texts for interpretation is uh, uh, there are sacred texts starting from the Bible, but if we go to legal text, we are going uh, immediately to the American Constitution, which is an interpreted text uh, um, as well. Um, then, um, obviously, the separation of powers gives a guarantee for, for this uh, situation by giving a consolidated text which is interpreted. And there has been a big criticism from the point of view of separation of powers is the judicial activism. And in Hungary, we had been coming up in 1990, we were a very special situation, which is uh, since then, since the political elite, and that has been rightly said, to, couldn't come up with a new constitution. I would like to quote from the, one of the first uh, uh, decisions of the Constitutional Court, which is a, in itself is a very prime example of judicial activism, uh, where the Constitutional Court uh, has uh, deleted from the Hungarian legal system the death penalty, which was a courtesy towards legislators. I was a member of parliament at that time, so I think it was a good thing that it was not the legislators who had to do it. And uh, later on, the uh, respective governments could join the necessary treaties, which are, uh, which are all over in Europe, are against death penalty. So it was a big act, but that, uh, no one questions that that was an act of, uh, of clear judicial activism. But that, in that sentence, uh, the president of the Constitutional Court, Laszlo Shoyom, um, at that time was writing that since it was in 1990, the new amended constitution was not longer than one year old. Um, then uh, uh, it was writing, she was writing that uh, the Constitutional Court, since there will be a new constitution, have to interpret not the real text of the Constitution, which is contradictory, which has uh, problems of consistency and so and so, but the basic principles of constitutionalism, and that became the theory and the doctrine of the so-called invisible Constitution. So, um, and the political elites for 20 years couldn't come up with a new text, a new consolidated text, uh, uh, which would be interpreted. So this created a, a situation which uh, created a situation for basically for constitutional lawyers and lawyers and judges is a very, um, a very good situation and very important to study is a especially strong constitutional discourse uh, conducted by the constitutional court in Hungary. Which means that, uh, and especially in the first period under the chairmanship of uh, the um, of, of the Constitutional Court by Laszlo Shoyom, a very strong judicial activism, which from a very strict interpretation of the separation of powers created a situation of clear judicial activism and shift of powers from legislator 
to uh, the constitutional review. So I think the basic principle, and if you are, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going uh, in details for the political discussion. Uh, there is a two-third majority <laughs> against uh, those who are defending the constitution here. So uh, I can really be very empathic with the opposition in the Hungarian parliament there. So I cannot go to all arguments and I am happy to provide on all specific points on churches, election law, anything which has been raised here. Uh, but I'm raising the, the basic principle question, but for me uh, was an important thing that we had to shift this balance and create a state uh, in which the executive, the judicial branch, constitutional review is taking its place and is balanced. The political powers for 20 years couldn't provide a new consolidated text of the constitution which left a rule of very wide interpretation of the text. Hungary, you have to know that Hungary has the, one of the widest spheres, even by legally regulated sense, uh, of constitutional review, which was a paradise for constitutional lawyers. It was a joy for me as a lawyer who was uh, having some, some say. The Hungarian constitutional law was a living law of 20 years developed here. Um, we, when we were writing the constitution, especially the Bill of Rights parts of it, we, we quoted basically the half part of the Bill of Rights is, uh, which has been borrowed not from the original uh, list of Bill of Rights comes from the constitutional court decisions, the other for the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, uh, there. Uh, so we, this, is a, this is really a gold mine for, uh, for us, but that created a situation. Let's take Hungary is not Hungary, but Greece. Taking back the pensions, by one two-third as the European Commission is demanding and the European Council is demanding now on Greece. In the Hungarian constitutional court would live only two or three months because of inherited uh, vested rights which would be, would be there. Um, and uh, that creates, a, again, that's a very striking example why you need a manageable state where the, uh, where the uh, elected branch uh, of the, of the legislation has to take responsibility for the decisions and also a necessary constitutional review because constitutional review in theory is a logical enterprise. It's for the defense of the constitution of the first text which is on the top of the Kelsenian uh, system of, uh, um, of the hierarchy of the laws. The constitutional court is a guarder of this principal law in which its guards that the constitution is observed and the, it gets through the hierarchy of the laws. But it is interpretation and not legislation. I, I stop here and uh, I leave uh, for the political and other arguments for, for a later point. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the qu first question is whether there was a need for a new constitution. Uh, there have been mentioned different reasons uh, at the time of the constitution making why Hungary needs a new constitution. One was that it's from 1949, as it has been mentioned, but actually it's just a frame, the whole content has been changed. The other was that in the preamble there, uh, there was a short uh, sentence that uh, this whole constitution, I mean the former one, is valid only until the new constitution will be approved and it's just a transitory constitution. And it's true, but I mean I do not really find these arguments uh, convincing because with the, with the legal technique of modification you can do anything. I mean you could delete from the preamble that half sentence actually. You can even change through modification the title of the constitution and instead of the constitution of 1949 you can exchange the title into 2010 or 11. So I do not think that any, any legal need there was for, the, for a new constitution because there cannot be any you know, in a conceptually, any, any legal need for a new constitution with a technique of, of modification or, or amendment, you can, you can change anything uh, in the substance. So if you, if you really approve a new constitution, that, that is by definition a symbolic political act. And the real question is how much uh, it was needed, but it is not really a legal, uh, legal question. I, I did like the, the old constitution. I mean, I, I spent quite a few years with it and I, 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 I worked on it, but I do have some, some sympathy for those who, who say that, that sometimes it's useful for symbolic reasons. 
uh, especially if things not if things don't go well like you know something like a new beginning for the country uh, so that could be a reason, but this is rather like a political speculation, and um, I do not really like to do that too much, so I'm changing to the next topic. The next topic is uh, how much is the new constitution legitimate? Also, legitimacy is a, it's a very complicated uh, concept, uh, and there are different definitions of, of, of legitimacy, like whether it's worthy to be, to be followed and so on. There is one, uh, one issue one issue again which, uh, which I would like to emphasize, um, and that would be again the, the idea of constitutionalism. Now, nowadays we, we, think, we think that, uh, that the constitution is, is worthy to be, to be followed if it somehow ensures the, the self-restraint of the, of the political power. And for that is the, the most important institution in Hungary. The constitutional court. There are also other solutions how you do it. I mean, in the UK, there's obviously no constitutional court, but you have always something which substitutes it, like constitutional conventions in the UK or in the Netherlands. It's it's basically the international law which, which plays the same role. Or in Switzerland, the referenda play a similar role. And in Hungary, uh, to a certain extent, to 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 some statutes, it has been switched off. And I, I. I really uh, find it very sad that, that it happened like that, and that is a, that is a reason for concern. Uh, because the constitutional court is uh, somehow the Archimedean point of, of any constitutional uh, system. At other points, actually, the, the new constitution is better off than the, than, uh, than the old one, for example. Uh, procedurally, I mean, the old constitution, the 19, I mean, formally 19, uh, 49, but substantively it's 1989 uh, and 1990. Uh, so most of the of the former constitution substantively has been approved in 1989 uh, by bodies which were, as Professor Hame uh, mentioned, not uh, legitimated through through democratic uh, elections. So as a matter of fact, uh, procedurally, the new constitution is better off than the old one, but. I do not think that procedures actually matter so much. I think that uh, for the legitimacy, what actually matters is the content of the constitution, what is in the, in the I mean, if you have a look at, uh, at constitutions in the world, how they uh, have been made very often, you find, you find blatant uh, uh, procedural mistakes. I mean, it has already been mentioned that the French constitution was adopted illegal, illegally, but it's the same with the US constitution. There was, I mean, at, at the time there were there were the so-called Articles of Confederation, which <laughs> prohibited the procedure which has been followed. But also the German Constitution, the, the Grundgesetz, when it was adopted, then you can you can clearly prove that uh, that the occupying uh, uh, powers, the military powers, actually gave the frame how to do it, and at the end they put the stamp on it, which is uh, which is uh, actually incredible. Uh, from from a legitimacy point of uh, of view, but nowadays nobody cares about it because procedures do not matter so much for for the legitimacy. And just a few remarks about uh, what uh, what my colleagues uh, have mentioned. So you don't, don't just have parallel monologues, but we also talk to each other a little bit. Uh, that's a very interesting question. What what Professor Harme mentioned about the the rule on the uh, on the four-fifths uh, majority about the new, new constitution. Basically, the 1994-1998 the uh, uh, legislative period, uh, in that time, the parliament adopted a rule that the new constitution can be adopted only by four-fifths majority. But the, this rule has been adopted by, by two-thirds majority. And there was a the debate in Hungarian constitutional scholarship whether this rule is actually still valid or not. And there were some people who actually said that this rule is still valid, and I mean, it sounds a bit absurd, but it wasn't sure what is actually the, the text of the, of the Constitution. Some people said that this rule, that the new Constitution has to be adopted by four-fifths majority is still there in the Constitution, uh, and others said that actually uh, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, valid or it was enforced only until 1998 
was because of a codificatory mistake, which would be difficult to, uh, to explain. And my opinion is that actually, since 1998, this rule was not enforced anymore. Nevertheless, <laughs> the governing party now actually um, uh, tried to delete it from the constitution, which I find it a bit amusing because they deleted something which wasn't there, but uh, I don't think that, that that was actually a problem, this, uh, this four-fifths, or that was not the problem, this four-fifths majority issue. And another remark to, uh, uh, to, to Dr. Sayer, it's about the, the invisible constitution. It's a very famous concept uh, from Hungary. Uh, uh, Laszlo Sójom, the first president of the Constitutional Court, used this, uh, used this concept. And uh, basically he said that because uh, the old Constitution has so many gaps and because it, uh, it is so unclear at certain points, uh, they are using also an, a so-called invisible constitution, but an invisible constitution. But this invisible constitution, even though it's uh, probably the name is, is unfortunate, but I think it does exist in every country where there is a constitution. Record. This invisible constitution is nothing else but the system or the, or the series of, of, of precedents and legal doctrines which every constitutional court is using. So normally politicians don't like it, and I understand that, uh, but I think it's necessary, and I don't think it's a particularly strong argument against constitutional courts that they do use it because this is in the nature of their job. Just, uh, this debate reminded me that in the early 90s there was a big debate about uh, whether it's possible uh, to uh, create a democratic constitutions uh, in, uh, during the transitions. Uh, the, the majority view, there was a big debate in the East European Constitutional Review on this issue and the point was that uh, 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 in most of the cases it's very hard to make in a democratic way a democratic constitution. Uh, now the next question, and we try to speed up a little, uh, is related to the issue that was raised by several uh, of the participants already. This is a question uh, whether the number of cardinal laws was too high and uh, whether these uh, whether do these guarantee uh, uh, enough uh, they give enough guarantees to separation of powers, fundamental rights, and whether they allow governance of a democratically elected new government. So that's that's is a question that came up uh, several times. So now we go to the opposite order, and then uh, this will be uh, the question that uh, uh, will open it up to that uh, also the possibility for you to ask questions. But first, uh, let's uh, still go the opposite way around. Thank you very much. Cardinal laws in, in Hungary are now basically two-thirds majority laws. Uh, which is pretty much the same majority as uh, what you need for, a, for the constitution, a new constitution. There is a slight difference that for the constitution you need two-thirds of all uh, MPs and for cardinal laws you need two-thirds of those MPs, MPs uh, who, who are present. And as a matter of fact, the number of cardinal laws is now lower than it, than it was. I mean, formerly, there are, of, of course, different countings because there are quite a few references in the text uh, to cardinal laws, that cardinal law will regulate this and this question, but some of them are related to each other very closely, so it means that they actually refer to one single uh, cardinal law. And uh, as far as I can see, the, the number is actually lower. Formerly, it was about uh, 28 uh, topics which had to be regulated in cardinal laws, and now it's, it's 26. So, the number is lower, but I think there is a problem with the cardinal laws, and that, that problem is that formerly most of these uh, cardinal laws uh, regulated uh, this, uh, basic uh, institutions, basic constitutional in, uh, institutions, and, uh, and fundamental rights, and now the, the emphasis has shifted. Also some topics remain, but the emphasis has shifted, and now quite a few issues are regulated uh, which, are, which are policy, traditionally policy issues like basic features of the tax system or the basic, basic features of the, of the pension system. So the topics have, not the number, the number, numbers didn't change so much or slightly actually went down, but the topics have changed. And now it's much more policy orientated, which uh, is problematic for two reasons. One is that uh, these are issues which uh, from time to time uh, have to be changed. 
like uh, tax issues or, or, the, uh, or, or the pension system. Uh, it, these are issues where, where you know, economi economists plan and then suddenly they realize that they, they plan badly and then we have a new crisis and then you have to redesign the whole thing. And it, can, it cannot work if, if it's in cardinal. So there is an efficiency problem, I think, with, with, the, with the new topics. And there's another problem. The other problem is that, uh, that the newly elected government, which doesn't have the two-thirds majority, which, as Dr. Sire rightly said, it's very difficult to get. It's exceptional that, that this uh, government party has now two-thirds majority, but normally it's very difficult to, to achieve. So if there is a new government, uh, then this new government, even though it has the, the, the approval of the majority of the, of the population, will be unable to change these policy issues, even though they belong somehow to the core uh, issues of a uh, what, what the newly elected democratic government uh, would like to change. So I, I, I think these are the, 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 the two problems. It also depends, of course, how the, the constitutional court will, uh, will understand uh, its role. If the constitutional court will try to, uh, to narrow down these topics as far as it's possible, for the reasons I mentioned, then the problem will be smaller. If it doesn't do it, then the problem will be bigger. So that also has to be uh, seen how, how, how it's happening. And the second part of the question, how far the new cardinal laws ensure separation of powers and, uh, and the protection of fundamental rights, that's a huge topic. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure we can, we can go into, uh, into details uh, with that. I mean, Professor Rama mentioned the, the registration of, of, of churches. I do think that's also an issue which, uh, which should be uh, resolved and which is, which is problematic. Uh, right now, the, another cardinal law is the cardinal law in the constitutional court. That's pretty much a good piece of legislation, I think. Uh, with most, I can, I can actually agree. Uh, and yeah, it would be too long. I think there are like 20 statutes. So. Well, if uh, non-Hungarians feel uh, a little bit uh, outsiders to the domestic uh, political debate of Hungary of the internal references, then uh, uh, we are at service, I think, all four of us for, for help you if you don't understand something. Um, but um, we are got used to this kind of debates, uh, debating our constitution in front of uh, foreign and uh, other audiences is in fact uh, itself showing a little bit the, uh, the difficulty. So I a little bit rephrase my, uh, or recast my uh, first uh, sentences about how good that we are debating uh, uh, the Hungarian constitution. I think it should be rather a real European debate and not just Hungarians. Uh, uh, debating not only in Hungary but outside of the borders of Hungary. But anyway, um, uh, on the point, uh, let me also reflect to some which has been said. Um, an academic obviously says uh, very rightly that uh, politicians do not like um, uncertainty, especially as I described the separation of powers uh, when there is a law. The judge's job is to legislate and not to make law. We have a very serious problem in the European Union. I mean, if you study European law, the European Court of Justice is a black box and no one knows what is coming out at the end because the European law is so uncertain, so much not uh, according to the national, uh, national standards. Uh, so it's really a little bit like the common law system in, in Britain, that, uh, but that has a long tradition and a long, long practice and, uh, um, and ways to doing it. Um, that's, all, that's obviously not something which uh, politicians like, and the reason why we didn't make a new constitution was not that we wouldn't want it, it was a plan from the last 20 years, but uh, there hasn't been any uh, majority for that. The last two-third majority was between 1994 and 1998, but the, then two governing parties, uh, uh, then the socialists and the liberals who are sitting left to us, um, then uh, they couldn't agree at the end, so finally they dropped uh, the project. Um, the, um, the other point on churches, because it has, has, has been mentioned already twice, um, it's again a domestic uh, tradition. Hungary is, uh, is the home of religious tolerance. 
the Torda Declaration from the 16th century is the first document of religious tolerance between the different Protestant, Catholic, and other churches. We, in fact, refer, ma making references to that. And the 1894 law um, of uh, adopted uh, uh, religions is also something which everyone, or most of the many countries, has been copied after that. But this is just an introduction that uh, uh, the point that we have our own traditions in this area. Uh, in 1990, I was part of the uh, new making of the new law already as a, as a not, not uh, yet elected uh, party of the new uh, churches, which created an American type of uh, church, uh, church law, uh, which was different from the, uh, from the European uh, law or the 1894 example, which Hungary has established about established religion. Because the, the main distinction between American and European system of regulating churches is basically nothing else that uh, in the case of the uh, American regulation, there is no taxpayer money is involved. The European law of churches is mixing public financing of churches and the, and the status of churches. The American law doesn't. Even tax exemptions are uh, rarely applied there. So when Hillary Clinton writes a letter to the Hungarian prime minister that we have to apply the American system of legislation, then in the Hungarian system it would mean that we have to support all of their uh, religious, uh, especially, especially caritative, uh, health and educational activities. The Hungarian law and most of the European laws on churches are about financing churches and not about the status. The status of churches is evident that everyone can exercise their right for their own religion. And in whatever form, and the state exercises, like in the European, Char uh, European Constitution and Lisbon Treaty, when it speaks about churches and different religious and uh, vocational organizations. This is the whole thing. One is that they can, uh, can exercise. The other is whether they have the right for state financing, whether they have the right for public taxpayers' money, which is not the American Secretary of State who has to decide uh, where the Hungarian government is going to uh, spend uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, but that's for churches. And I'm asking now for the, uh, for the question on cardinal laws. Uh, it's a as uh, Andras Jakob has said, it's a complicated question. Even the Venice Commission has made a huge mistake because they completely misunderstood the system in the lack of knowledge of the background of the difference between uh, two-third majority laws, cardinal laws, and the Constitution itself. This is why they made the mistake that they were uncertain about whether cardinal laws are subject to, uh, to constitutional review. Yes, they are. According to the Venice Commission, it's uncertain from the Constitution, but if you read the Constitution and you know the Hungarian legal system, it's a clear question that cardinal laws are subjected to constitutional review, which means that they should be in line with the Constitution. They are, don't enjoy any special role. Their adoption is what is different. And uh, concerning the, the area that there is a shift from regulating basic liberties, where there are no problems because if there is a constitutional review and there are clear-cut principles, there is 20 years of uh, a constitutional court practice which is not changing because the text didn't change in substance. Uh, the Bill of Rights the text hasn't changed in substance. That means that it's not, not important. But let me say one example why um, uh, the, it has been also mentioned by, by Zita Gurmai here that uh, some political forces feel that the two-third majority laws, cardinal laws, are binding the future legislators uh, in their activity. And this is that break. That break is the first uh, principle which has been introduced. The, the first Hungarian constitution is the first which introduced that the government and the, and the legislation cannot spend or cannot create a budget which is, which is uh, from one year to another is increasing the indebtedness of the country. This is a, a dead break which has been built into the system. And until it reaches 50%, it's still an extraordinary situation. Uh, this dead break, uh, the, the colleagues are here are claiming that it, it bounds the hands of future governments of free economic policy. And the answer on my behalf is yes. It binds because let me, let me give you some little Hungarian economy since you are teaching economy. In 1989, 
1998, sorry, when the first Fidesz government was coming into office, the de budget deficit was uh, for, of Hungary or the, uh, the, the balance of uh, indebtedness was 67%. Uh, in four years' time, the Orban government, the first Orban government uh, to 2002, was putting it down to 53%. Then eight years of socialist government was coming. Hungary is indebted up to the neck or even over it. Uh, we are under the water. Everyone knows that who is, who, who is reading economic press. Uh, in 2010, when the second Orban government taking office, the indebtedness of the country was 80%. So it went, fr went up from 53% to 80%. This is why the country is so vulnerable, vulnerable at the moment. Um, so that's very simple mathematics shows that uh, uh, there might be an experimentation, and I consider it an experimentation in constitutional law, to limit somehow how present decision makers, the legislation, uh, could be somehow bound that they couldn't spend money in the expense of future generation. So here the constitutional principle is to create a balance between present generations and future generations. And the goal is not to bind the next uh, socialist, uh, Jobbik, or, uh, or um, uh, uh, LMP, uh, or Green government, uh, from, from uh, making uh, changes to the economic policy. The point is to create a balance between generations. This constitution, and it's, it's ingrained in many other elements, if you read the constitution you will see that, is, is a 21st century constitution from the point of view of responsibility for future generations. It uh, introduces, as, as we mentioned, uh, fiscal um, uh, uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability. This is the greenest constitution you can ever, ever read. Uh, you, you will see that text, and I'm expecting the Constitutional Court practice on that. Uh, I hope it will be as activist as it was uh, in the last 20 years on other areas. And also demographic uh, balance uh, by, uh, by giving some, uh, some clear preferences uh, in um, keeping the demographic, demographic balance of the country. So in that sense, the, the two-third majority laws, and among them the debt break, is really creating a rearrangement between uh, different uh, generations and trying to, to break, which is, our, which is in my lifetime, a 30 years of ingrained experience that present governments, because in lack of any limits, they are always were looking for, uh, for indebting the future generations from the expense of, uh, 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 on the expense of future generations of the, uh, for the present. So we try that if a constitutional break is working, and that's again a check, a new check on the legislature because it takes away a very important portion of one of the basic functions and one of the basic rights of the legislation because I mean, as the constitutionalism and parliamentarism has started, that the parliament gained the right over for making a budget. But if there is a debt break, if your, your budget powers are limited because you cannot inc increase the budget from one year to another, then that's a new constitutional break on you, which is limiting the legislation's, uh, uh, legislation's uh, uh, powers. So this is an, another check on the almighty legislation in contradiction what the political claims has been that it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's increasing. It's not. In this case, it's very clear. And in the case of cardinal laws on several others, it's also clear, and it's uh, Andras Jakob who made it clear, that the claim that their number is higher than it was before is not yet. The Venice Commission, when criticizing cardinal laws, is, card is criticizing 20 years of practice in Hungary in lack of knowledge what was there. Uh, so so that's, that's, again, a pitfall of... Uh, uh, d uh, analyzing something which you just learned from, uh, from, uh, uh, from your uh, two visits uh, in, in Budapest. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, stick to the time because then we, uh, we, we will have no more than three questions actually. But I know that, uh, of course, uh, as a father of this issue, you are very enthusiastic, uh, I would say, for, for the issue. But I, am, I really would like to get questions from the podium as well. Okay, and of course that was more than five minutes, but anyway, I tried to restrict myself. Okay, so first of all, let's make it clear, uh, when uh, Dula Horn, that was the Dula Horn government that time, 40, uh, 1994 and 1998, the reason why we haven't had uh, a new constitution, because really take into consideration the four-fifths, 
And of course, as that time, the opposition party was not uh, very keen uh, what uh, the two-third majority actually wanted, or the 75% wanted, uh, that's why we didn't do it. Of course, there were several tries during the last, uh, uh, last uh, period, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, uh, that's why, uh, you know, the democratic opposition of the Hungarian parliament asked for legal guarantees ensuring that the new constitution is based on broad political uh, consensus, debated in a democratic way and, uh, and enjoyed substantial uh, popular support. And of course, Fidesz rejected uh, this idea. Uh, what is more, uh, it uh, repealed uh, the former, uh, former rule demanding this uh, four-fifths majority to adopt a new constitution, allowing uh, the governing parties to act without the support of the opposition. And of course, that was the reason that, uh, that my party, and, and as uh, Josef mentioned, uh, politics can be different, which is the so-called OCO party decided to stay away uh, from the constitutional uh, process. And of course, uh, if, if, we, if we stick to the, to the question, of course, my question is to high compared to what? And of course, uh, in France, uh, which is the so-called home country of the legal instrument, uh, there are some 30 cardinal laws at present. And uh, this is more or less the same number of cardinal laws uh, as foreseen uh, by the Hungarian uh, fundamental uh, law. And of course, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's, uh, they plan uh, 32. But in my opinion, the differences, and I would say the problem, is not in the numerical aspect of the issue, but in the fields to be regulated by the cardinal law. So I think that uh, we should stick to, to, the, to the subject uh, as uh, well. Constitutionalist legal experts told me that uh, the system of cardinal laws is uh, designated uh, to ensure the permanence of constitutional system by filling in the gaps of a relatively short constitution with organic law. And of course, uh, I just uh, to quote you, the Spanish Constitution states, section 84, that organic acts are those relating to the implementation of fundamental rights and public freedoms, those approving the statutes of autonomy and the general electoral system and other laws provided for in uh, the constitution. And of course, uh, the subjects of organic laws are usually the basic aspect uh, of the functioning of a state, like institutional issues, the structure of the state, fundamental rights, and of course, uh, the electoral law. And in the light of this, uh, I have a question. How come that cardinal laws in Hungary will regulate issues or sectors such as family policy, the fundamental rules of general taxation, and of the pension system? Actually, uh, I'm not alone uh, with my question and concern uh, opinion, and I just could quote again uh, the Venice Commission uh, who highlights the danger of such an, uh, such an uh, arrangement, I would say. And of course, uh, it says that, uh, it considers that Parliament should be able to act in a flexible manner in order to adapt new framework conditions and face new challenges uh, within the society. Functionally, of a democratic system is rooted in its permanent ability to change the more policy issues are transferred beyond the powers of simple majority, the less significance will future elections have and more possibilities does a two-third majority have of cementing, cementing, and I just would like to underline this word, its political preferences and, and the country's uh, legal order. Elections which according to Article 3 of the first protocol to, to the European Court of Human Rights should guarantee the expression of the opinion of the people in the choice of legislator, and of course would become meaningless if legislation would not be able to change important aspects of the, of the legislation. Uh, that should have been enacted without, with, with a simple majority, I would say. So when not only the fundamental principle, but also very specific and detailed rules on certain issues will be enacted in cardinal laws, the principle of democracy itself is at risk, as I see. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, but since I'm the, the last to, to answer this question, everything has been already said, so I have to, to react. And I would like to start with my reactions to some, some re-reactions to, to my earlier uh, statement. So uh, three of them uh, very shortly. Uh, Josef Sire mentioned that, that one of the reasons of curtailment of of constitutional court competences was judicial activism. 
and he also mentioned that probably some professors uh, teach it otherwise. Uh, yes, I, I indeed do. Uh, I had a class on Wednesday on a comparative constitutional law course on judicial uh, review, and my, my major uh, uh, staff of teaching was Hans Kelsen, who, uh, who said that, that the constitutional courts, even a, a, a much more limited type of constitutional court at that time, uh, not dealing with fundamental rights issues, for instance, was a negative legislator. Or I also teach uh, uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Marshall's saying in Marbury versus Madison, saying that what the Constitution is, is, is what the, the courts say it is. Uh, the second very minor thing uh, about this four-fifths rule, uh, very, very accurately, the, the Constitution, uh, Article uh, 24, Paragraph 5, and this is a clear, clear uh, text which was in the Constitution until, until uh, June 2010, <laughs> and uh, the major evidence, as, as Andras Jakob mentioned, that it, that it was annulled. Uh, Non-existence rules cannot be uh, annulled. So it said not that the Constitution needs a, a four-fifths uh, uh, vote for adoption, it said that the, the rules of drafting of a new constitution needs an agreement with, with, with uh, four-fifths. So how the new constitution will be uh, drafted, it needed a four-fifths majority. And this was cancelled from the constitution uh, in order to have a one-party constitutional drafting process. Uh, the third very, very third answer to the, to the uh, religious issue. Uh, I understood from, from the explanation of Joseph Sayer that the very reason of deregistering de the already registered uh, about 300 churches was that, that uh, the state finances was actually not, not to provide. But then why not regulate the state finances of the churches and not the registration? These are two different issues. So you can, you can regulate the state finances of the churches without touching the registration of the churches. The registration of the churches is the core element of the religious freedom. And the, the practice of the, of the European Court of Human Rights is clear about that. You cannot have a registration system where only one body, the parliament, the, the, the politicians decide who can be a church and who, who cannot without any independent remedy to this. Uh, fourth issue, uh, uh, cardinal laws. I do not want to, to start a war of the numbers, but uh, this is for sure. The old constitution named 13 cardinal laws. You can check it. The new cardinal law uh, uh, mentioned 25 cardinal laws. You can check it. Uh, this is true what, what Andras Jakob said, that this 25 means actually more subjects, more than, more than 25. Uh, but I agree with, with Andras that the crucial issue are the policy issues. So taxation, family policy, or pension policy cannot be subject of a two-third majority law. Uh, because if you argue, as Joseph Sayer argued here, that this is the, this is the, the very reason of that is to determine the, the future generation's uh, uh, fate, then that means that this government is entitled to decide what is, the, what is the interest of the next generations. In parliamentary system, to decide about the future generation is always the task of the current government. This is about parliamentary democracy. The next government can decide what, what kind of tax tax uh, policy, what kind of family policy, or what kind of pension policy serves the current and the future generations. If you decide with two-third majority these policies, you actually 
uh, enable the next uh, po democratically elected uh, governments to decide on that, that issues. Uh, okay, uh, one, one more, more issue, and this is also a reflection to what uh, Josef Sayer said in the very beginning, that the constitution is an act of a sovereign state, which is true. Uh, but I also think that it's true that if, if a sovereign state entering into uh, different uh, international communities as the European Union or the Council of Europe, of course it's not anymore only a, 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 an issue of the sovereign state to comply with the principles of that community. So I think this is a legitimate discussion whether our sovereign act of the constitution really complies with those international principles and values. Thank you very much. Uh, it was futile to think uh, uh, that we can go through even just uh, half of the question that we wanted to ask. Uh, uh, this is what we agreed uh, before. Uh, so we are uh, still at the very beginning and uh, as uh, I'm not entitled to transform this meeting to a constitutional assembly, uh, 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 basically what we have to do is give just a chance uh, uh, to the audience to ask also questions. Uh, we have to be actually really brief uh, because uh, uh, Zita Gurmai has to leave in 15 minutes uh, from now, if I uh, understood correctly. So a few questions uh, because we would like also to leave uh, a chance uh, for uh, the panelists uh, also to answer uh, uh, the general questions. Okay, so this is a question um, to, to Zita Gurmai. Um, Ruth Rubio Marin and I teach comparative constitutional law here at BUI. So no, no founding mother in the committee. Uh, first of all, was this ever discussed? Was this an issue at all that was raised? Uh, I mean, it's not just that the family law as I understand it, was rendered the subject of organic law. It's that there was a, an amendment also regarding the entrenchment of the right of the fetus, uh, of uh, family, traditional family forms. So what was this an issue? I mean, talk about comparative constitutionalism. You see France, Italy, Portugal, several countries adopting constitutional amendments to make sure that women have a political voice moving towards a parity democracy model. So 2012, these things are done just by men. It's seen as a legitimacy question, not what is the reaction in civil society? Yeah, my, my question is for Professor uh, Holmoy. It's, uh, it's about the institution of the Ombudsman and what is, the, what is its, uh, its status under the new constitution? Because this was an institution that just drafted a very critical, uh, that drafted a very critical report of the uh, Fidesz government uh, management of the, uh, Roma, of the Roma situation and especially what happened in Janjashpot. And that, that was um, actually something widely discussed by European media. And it, it's actually a far bigger narrative that is nowadays current that is nowadays present in the in the European media it's not just about the European it's not just about the Hungarian constitution it's also about um, uh, I would say the way the um, Fidesz government is uh, dealing with the Roma minority and um, just very briefly what is happening to the uh, to, to this critical institution the institution of the Ombudsman I heard that it's going that it's not there anymore in case uh, Mr. Sire has something to say about it I would be glad to hear also his opinion thanks is a question to Mr. Zayer, which is not legal. Isn't the fact that this debate takes place that is so hot in Hungary, that resonate in Brussels, isn't the fact that the rules of the game are contested and contentious, and that the opposition boycotts if I have understood correctly, the final voting of the Constitution, isn't it politically a sign of failure of the constitutional process in itself?
Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm not a lawyer, but a historian, so I, I, have, um, I have a question about uh, symbolic politics, because I noticed that in, um, and this is to Dr. Saya, um, I noticed that in um, Article J, the commemoration of the 23rd of October now only refers to 1956, but in the 1991 National Holiday Law, it also referred to the proclamation of the Third Republic in 89. And I was wondering whether he could elaborate on that, why this was left out. Thanks. Since uh, Zita Gurmay has to leave, uh, I have to add one question that was uh, one of the last questions, uh, uh, and I hope uh, she won't leave without uh, uh, addressing just briefly this question. That is, what are the external and internal challenges to this new constitution? It uh, would be good if you could just briefly uh, address this issue before you leave. So first of all, I'm very thankful for, for listening to us. It's a, it's a great opportunity, and unfortunately, in Hungary, we haven't had that type of uh, discussion. And of course, uh, I remember there was only one debate in, uh, in the Hungarian uh, parliament uh, where we had uh, 15 speakers, and uh, there was only one who, who said uh, that he is very uh, delighted with the new constitution. 14 others said they are not very happy, and they, they criticized it. And of course, uh, uh, the one who was very much for became a new constitutionalist uh, of, of, the, of the court. Uh, probably it, it was not by chance. Okay, so uh, just, just to give a type of clear explanation, uh, uh, the word gender became a word of curing, which means that uh, every document in which we had the word gender, it, it is changed into family. Uh, which means that uh, it is quite funny when we talk about gender pay gap, I don't know how can I make a definition, especially when today is the European uh, gender pay gap day. Actually, I was the, the, the key fighter for this in 2007 because I believe it's, it's a type of inequality in, uh, in, uh, in Europe when, when women have to work uh, actually more than two months uh, just to get a type of equal treatment. But of course, we are very far away that because we had 15% that time and now it is 17.5%. Uh, okay, so let's, let's concentrate a little on, uh, on, on the social rights families and, uh, and women rights and, and actually uh, values. And of course, I, I also would like to talk about the protection of the fetus from the, the, from, from the con conception as, as uh, SIC. And uh, as it has been mentioned several times, uh, uh, the fundamental law contains a provision that protects the fundamental human right to life from the moment of, 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 uh, of conception. It is clear uh, to me that this can easily lead to the restriction of autonomy of women in early stages of pregnancy. And I'm really shocked because uh, we are in the 21st century and I believe that we women are grown up to, to, to decide what to do with our own uh, body and to decide whether we want to get pregnant or not. Sometimes it happens, my dear male colleagues, because it's, we are not alone who are, who are in, in this, uh, in this uh, battlefield, I would say. And of course, uh, uh, it is, uh, and of course, uh, as a woman and, and of course a politician, I don't want to suppose an intent uh, like uh, this from our government. However, my fears get more uh, foundations than I put some event in this, in this regard in this context. And actually, three or four years ago, uh, we, we just had a lead, no sex before marriage. Whether we have funding in the European Union for, for this. And actually, I was really amazed because uh, if we talk about the European Union again, I believe that this is really interfering into my private field, uh, uh, I would say. And of course, I'm very unhappy that uh, in spring 2011, the government launched a new anti-abortion and, and pro-adoption campaign on posters largely funded from the European Union Progress Fund under the heading Improvement of Gender Mainstreaming in National Policies and Programs within the framework of a work-life balance program. And the manipulative poster showed the photo of a fetus much more developed than the legal age for the limit of abortion. Instead of one or three months old fetus, it was about a seven months old one. So I just would like to make sure that it's very difficult to, to know how, ma how many months, but of course, let's be precise. And were built around making women choosing abortion feel guilt as the fetus said, let me live. 
And of course, in July, Mrs. Redding, our Commissioner for Justice uh, on Fundamental Rights and Citizenship, announced that the Commission has contacted the Hungarian authorities to stop this campaign and also informed the consequences of uh, an ina inappropriate use of the Progress Funds uh, as the original project was uh, won the, for gender mainstreaming trainings uh, of local government. And I would say that this is really very far away from, uh, from, from the issue. And of course, even worse things happened in, in December 2012, and two Christian Democrat uh, MEPs handed in a motion uh, for amendment, uh, cutting 400 million forints uh, from the budget of 2012, labeled for assisting abortion prices of low-income mothers and transmitting the sum of, uh, of uh, child protection as well. And, uh, and of course, uh, I really would like to get the same time that Jozef got, so because I believe it is very important and we are 52% of the population and I have so many men around the table, so let me finish what I wanted because I believe that I'm here for discussion, not for stopping, especially when there is an issue which hurts uh, very much of the progressive women uh, in my country. Okay, on a side note, I may add uh, the problems may arise with regard to the artificial reproduction procedures as well, but of course, I respect the time and I'm not going to do into details, but I really would like to spend a little time with the definition of the family. I was querying during the German presidency that you cannot say in the Europe of 21st century that family in the classical terms exist because it does not exist, it exists in some part, but let us decide which type of family forms we live, whether we are men or women, or, or women, women, or men or men, because I believe that this is the freedom, the choice to live with somebody. And of course, in our new constitution, whether you have a baby and you are not married, you will get less state fund. Or less. Unbelievable. So they force you to be married to be in a marriage and to get a child in a marriage. And of course, it is clearly stated that relationship is between women and men. Come on, you interfere again into my private sphere, if I should say so. And of course, uh, the fundamental rule declares uh, the marriage is only between men and women. As I told you, this is, I would say, discriminates against gay and lesbian couples. And of course, uh, let's be clear, we have lesbian and gays uh, in, in, in Hungary who would love to live in a freedom uh, as, as they, uh, they get it. And of course, the family protection Cardinal No adopted at the end of 2011 defines family as marriage, as I already told you, men and women, and children on relatives in direct line. This means cohabitation partners or registered cohabitation partners now in a majority to married couples are not defined as family. I feel very sorry, it cannot happen in the 21st century. So the family protection bill carries a strong Catholic view, not only in the connection with marriage, but also about protection of fortis life from conception, resonating with the new constitution, as I already told you. So this is a very restrictive definition of the family. I asked my colleagues to look for the definition that is used by international human rights organization. And of course, the European Court of Human Rights estimates that the definition of family is dependent on the existence of close personal ties. So how we want to interfere again on, 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 on this issue? So I don't think that this is the reflect today in Hungary, but I, I do think that it, it should be. And of course, societies are not constant formation, and that's why I really believe that it is really crucial for us how we live, and they are always changing. People are finding new ways of sharing their lives with, with each other day by day, and of course, laws should reflect this, and fundamental and cardinal laws should at least be as flexible and to give the legislature that a chance to amend accordingly to law and not to exclude anyone. And now if you talk, talk about two-thirds, come on, how can we change this? And I believe that we cannot restrict uh, our nation, the holy nation, I would say. Thank you. Uh, so, unfortunately, we had, had no time to discuss the Ombudsman uh, institution's backsliding, because this was also subject of backsliding. The Hungarian constitutional system from, from 1989 started with a very diverse institution of Ombudspersons. Actually, uh, uh, the constitution and the, the implementing laws uh, instituted four different Ombudspersons. Ombudspersons, one for the general 
uh, uh, human rights issues, one for data protection and freedom of information together, one for minority issues, and one it's later uh, for future generations. This was now modified by the new constitution. There is only one ombudsperson for all of the fundamental rights enumerated in the, in the constitution, uh, meaning that the, the uh, independent uh, ombudspersons for minority issues and for future generation will be uh, deputies of this general ombudsperson. Uh, as responsible for the general ombudsperson. Uh, and the data protection uh, and freedom of information ombudsperson was, was uh, uh, changed to a governmental office. This is also one of the reasons of very harsh uh, European Union and Council of Europe criticism. This governmental institution will be, of course, not anymore uh, an independent uh, institution. Uh, the head of it uh, will be will be appointed by the by the uh, prime minister. Uh, actually, the the acting ombudsperson uh, who was uh, elected for for six years and his term was was actually not over was uh, replaced by by uh, someone who will lead that that authority. Uh, uh, so this is also one of the uh, backsliding. Let me let me answer uh, uh, a part of your question, if if I I may, about the failure or or not failure, without without uh, going into very subjective uh, assessment. But let me let me uh, refer to uh, the only only public opinion poll which was carried out on the new constitution. Uh, and also about the old constitution. This was a, a, a survey made by, by uh, uh, actually my, my uh, home university in, in Budapest uh, with a uh, thousand people asked. And let me mention some of the results of, of that uh, public opinion poll. Uh, one third of the, of the people said that this constitution, the new one, was needed. Uh, 20% uh, said that this constitution uh, uh, accepts the people's will, while 30% said on the same on the old constitution. Uh, One second, just let me interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank Zita Gurmai for uh, uh, coming. Uh, uh, hope to see you back uh, uh, soon. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I was the rapporteur for the European Citizens Initiative. I would say I was a mama and Dalai Lama Sur from EPP was a papa. So that's why I'm really very keen to, to come back in a later stage. Thank you very much again, Laszlo, for invitation. So some, some more, more uh, uh, numbers, very few. 30% uh, of the people said that this constitution is a product of a background bargaining, while 17% said on the mentioned old illegitimate uh, constitution the same. 16% said that this constitution provides security, while 25 said uh, on the old one. 23% uh, said that this constitution strengthens democracy. 25 was on the old constitution. Uh, 23 said that one can identify uh, uh, himself with this new constitution. The figure for the old one was 24. 18% uh, said that this constitution sticks the nation together. The old one, 33. 15% uh, said that the constitution is lovable. 21 on the old one. And the most important and characteristic figure is 31% uh, said that this constitution is a dictatorial one, while on the old constitution, the figure was 17. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let me start with, uh, with the question which Zita has been uh, developing because uh, I'm sorry she left, uh, but uh, she knows, uh, unfortunately she knows my view 
on this uh, point because if you read the text, and uh, I really recommend again to read the text. I will, I will read it again and I will explain what, uh, how, what is the interpretation of this in the Hungarian uh, system. Um, Article L says, Hungary shall protect the institution of marriage as the union of men and women established by voluntary decision and the institution of family as the foundation of the subsistence of the nation. Hungary shall promote a commitment to have children. Protection of families shall be regulated by the cardinal statute. This is part of the thing which we have been discussing. Um, let me start with that, that the claim that there was no founding mother is not true. It sounds very well in a conference, but it's not true. If Katalin Sili, the former president, socialist president of the parliament, is a woman, and we all see that she is, uh, is uh, she was member of the uh, Constitution uh, uh, National Consultation Committee. Then in Parliament we have uh, several women and the votes which has been casted was uh, proportional to the fact how many women are uh, in, this, uh, in this process. So it's, uh, it would be a very exaggerated claim that there are no founding women. It could be said about the American Constitution because I don't know any women who has been done, but that was 200 years ago. But that's not true, uh, that there were no women among the, those who has been. Uh, Katalin City was one of the faces. She, she had proposed her own constitution uh, as well on this point. The second point, the interpretation of this text. If you read this text, it neither ba bans uh, abortion, neither bans or prohibits uh, same-sex marriage, uh, neither defines the family. So there is, the, 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 what, what Zita has said about that a single mother or father with a family of two, two, two people is in any way discriminated in the Hungarian legal system by the constitution or the bylaws which are coming down is simply not true. If any judge, any constitutional judge or a simple uh, normal judge would be deciding on that or see the whole other part of the legislation, you don't find any claim of that. There is no, it doesn't exist. The text only says, and why I'm saying, it doesn't, uh, doesn't prohibit uh, same-sex marriage. It just says that there is a protected type of marriage which is between men and women. Then it says it's not connected to the definition of family. If you read the text, it's clear. It's a neutral text. In a, in a sense of the Rawlsian principle of I don't know what the situation, what my situation would be, uh, it's it then and, and after I will know, it's completely neutral text from that point of view. It's not neutral in the wording, but in legal consequences. And I insist to that very strictly. In legal consequences, it's a neutral text because it protects every citizen regardless of their age uh, uh, and other, um, other uh, qualification materials. Uh, it doesn't define family. It doesn't say that the marriage, which is mentioned in the first part of the sentence of the text, is connected to that marriage which is mentioned later in the text. So please read the text. It doesn't doesn't prohibit abortion. It creates a state obligation to protect the life of the fetus. But it doesn't say the basic principle which, which is criticized here, which is not true, and she's rightly criticizing that. If, if that would be, I would make a very emotional uh, statement like her, that uh, you are criticizing the text which is not in the Constitution, which says that life begins with conception. This is not there, it's, it, this is a state obligation. State obligation means in a country, especially in Hungary, where abortion has been a normal practice uh, in daily life under the so socialist regime. Uh, it means that the state has obligations about creating institutions to helping people to have their children, or if they have abortion, the counseling and other materials. Please read the text again. I asked my colleague several times for this, uh, but, but the claims are sounding very well, but these are not true. Um, simply, these points are not true. So again, I, I, it doesn't ban uh, uh, bans, uh, neither gay marriage, nor, uh, the, uh, nor uh, bans abortion, -ish, and it doesn't define family. And it doesn't create even 
the state obligation of, uh, uh, of discriminating between those who are family and those who are not. It's not there, it's neutral. It completely complies with the Rawlsian principles of neutrality. That's my first point on, on that. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, may, maybe I'm emotional on that because the, the text, the, the wording is, has a scent of, of that conservative majority which was ad adopting it. But that conservative majority uh, was insisting that the text is neutral and in the, in the wording, it, it fits to their, uh, their uh, requirements. Please, please, again, again, read the text. It has no, I, I have been facing several women's organizations were sending letters to, to all kind of members of Hungary, Hungary and other parliaments that the new uh, Hungarian constitution is banning abortion. No, it doesn't even modify the situation that the present abortion law, which is existing since 1991, should be by any means considered unconstitutional. Because that was not the goal. The goal was exactly the opposite. On telegraphic style, I, I go, go on the others. You might, you might think on the basis of uh, our discussion that uh, Hungarians cannot even agree on numbers. There is a famous Hungarian film from the 50s which says that uh, two, uh, twice two, uh, sometimes five. Uh, that applies to Hungarian political debates, so we will never agree on the number of uh, cardinal laws. But um, on Ombudsman, the Ombudsman institution, in my conception, is someone which doesn't have any powers. The, the power of the Ombudsman, it comes from the Scandinavian legal and constitutional tradition. The Ombudsman speaks, speaks to the public, and by speaking, exercises pressure on government because he has a e special role in the constitutional framework. If there are three ombudsmen, if there are five ombudsmen, if five ombudsmen is speaking, no one hears it. If one ombudsman is speaking, I, I think the essence, there, is, there was a proliferation of ombudsmen in Hungary, which ended up the ombudsmen specifically fighting with each other. And it's not true again what Professor Halmai has said, that there is no ombudsman again for minorities and for the, um, and for the uh, protection of future generation. What we made is put one ombudsman at the top and deputies out of the three deputies, there are one responsible for future generation and the other is for minorities. But there is one ombudsman who's the institution unified. What concerns the Roma population and the question, the question is, uh, it's, it's very good, I sh we should have started with the questions because I think these are the misconceptions about the, uh, the constitution which has been, uh, has been there. Uh, this constitution, I myself negotiated with all of the minorities. Hungary has a, since 1990, has a system which is unprecedented in the world, uh, 13 national minorities have autonomies in a country where 98% where of the population is Hungarian. But for the first time after this new constitution, these minorities will have the right to send their members to parliament because we changed the rules for that. It creates for them a direct representation in parliament. It, it in, enhances the, it expands the right of minorities. The Roma population who has by the way, the only Roma in the European Parliament is, a, is nominated by Fidesz party since eight years. I cannot imagine that a population of uh, Europe which has 500, 000, 500 million people, 10 million out of them Roma, uh, a party, a dictatorial party like Fidesz is nominating the only Roma representative into European Parliament. Do, do, don't you see some uh, contradiction here? So I think the expansion of the minorities is there. It was the present government, which is beyond the constitution, but prohibited military marches from the extreme rights on the street. And you, you mentioned the concrete examples. This was a legislation by the new government. The socialist government tolerated these marches because uh, I, I don't know for what reason, I'm not giving political reasons, but this was the one which made it a crime that marching on the street in uniform, threatening minorities, namely the Roma minority, is a criminal act. And that comes to the, my conclusion, but my conclusion comes to your question, Professor. Uh, I think 
It's a very distorted way of thinking that just because there is criticism, there is something, uh, something a very serious problem and it de delegitimizing the, the whole process. If I would be an opposition against a two-third majority, I'm a politician for 25 years, I would have no interest, no political interest in participating in the constitution making process because I would know that they would be anyway making it after 20 years of failure for making a constitution. So in that sense, yes, it damages the, in a certain sense, the legitimacy of the, of the whole thing. But I think if we wouldn't do it, we wouldn't provide that authorization which we got from the very uh, massive election victory. It was very clearly said, if we get the two-third majority, there will be big changes. There will be big restructuring of the whole system. And the last point on the symbolic politics uh, on uh, 1989, for me, as a Fidesz politician who has been the founding member of Fidesz and fighting, I was running the first press uh, freedom case uh, with the help of Professor Halmai um, in the, uh, against the then communist government. But for me, the divi division line between communism and democracy is the 2nd of May 1990. The first free elections not the negotiations which had been done between illegitimate opposition or illegitimate uh, communist uh, uh, sources. This is the start of new Hungarian democracy. And in the same time, I think that this new Hungarian democracy has to reconnect with the 1,000 years of very progressive constitutional history of Hungary. This might be symbolic politics. And I mentioned that in the wording, there are certain sense which are giving preference to certain ideas, but not in the legal consequences, neither in mentioning uh, equal rights, neither, uh, no, neither nor on the other areas. So yes, there are several symbolic things. With Joseph Borrell, I had my debate in the Convention of Europe about whether Christianity should be mentioned. He mentioned, when, when we saw that Christianity is mentioned, then we, he was thinking Inquisition. I was thinking that it was an important uh, factor, uh, for instance, of constitutionalism, of human dignity, the Christian tradition. There are different lines of that. In the Hungarian constitution, in the preamble, what we say, and here again, I would like to ask you to pay on the wording, to pay attention to the wording, what we are saying, that Christianity had an important role in the history of Hungary, keeping Hungary together. This is a historic statement. And then comes the, comes the next sentence, which says, the owner, this is the normative sense, and the other is descriptive. This is writing, Christianity hasn't played an important role, and no historians would be disagreeing on, uh, on this sentence. This is what we wanted to put into the European constitution. Finally, we did that there is a common European religious tradition or something like that, which is very similar to that. But then the next sentence says that the owner without regard of whatever, the religious traditions of Hungary, in plural. There is no preferential religion there. Please read the text. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, the good news is that uh, uh, debates on constitutions never end. The bad news is that this debate has to end. Uh, so uh, we still have, uh, uh, Andra, I should say, uh, Gabor insists to have one minute uh, uh, on uh, one issue. Uh, so uh, uh, since uh, this is relates to Zita's uh, 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 this debate with uh, uh, Zita, so I would give you the floor, but really one minute and then Andras. Thank you, I'm sorry really, but it's, it's on the text. So it's true that on abortion, nothing uh, is decided yet. The, the Constitution really said that state obligation to pro, pro, uh, protect the fetus. What consequences it will be on reproduction rights, we do not know yet. So really, there is no prohibition of abortion. It's, it's right. But there is a prohibition of same-sex marriage. Uh, uh, fortunately, Josef Sayer read the text. The text does not say what he then interpreted that the protection of, 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 uh, of men and, and women as, as an institution of marriage. The Constitution says marriage is an institution of men and women, full stop. This means no, no same-sex marriage is allowed under the Constitution. For my interpretation, this is clear. Uh, 
and there were, there were constitutional court decisions on, on family issues, unfortunately. The constitutional court declared that registered partnership for uh, heterosexual couples is unconstitutional. So one, one type of family, uh, registered partnership, even for heterosexual couples, is constitutionally prohibited because it's too close to the marriage institution. And the, the very last sentence, read the text, Christianity as keeping together the nation is mentioned in the preamble. I read again the text because, uh, and there is translation questions as well. We recognize the role of Christianity in preserving the nation. By any grammatical interpretation, this is a descriptive text. This is a historical statement. This is not a normative statement. We honor the various religious traditions of our country is an obligation. And then again, uh, maybe the, uh, the translation is not 100%. Um, uh, according to that, but Hungary shall, shall protect, Article L, Hungary shall protect the institution of marriage as the institution of man and woman established by voluntary decision. In the Hungarian text that goes that this form, read, read the Hungarian text please, uh, this form of marriage which is, has a state obligation for protection attached, it doesn't say that where there is no state obligation, uh, is, is, is impossible. So a future legislator is not limited to establish when the time comes, when there is a social uh, support for that, when the legislation really can establish, like in several other countries, same-sex marriages. But then it will not be a specially state obligation to protect, protect this spe specific marriage. But the marriage definition doesn't include that. So please read the text. And that's, that's very clear. Uh, that's very fr clear from that, uh, that point of view. And the, the other point as well, that it's not connected to family. The, the constitutional court decision, which has been mentioned, is not connected to the new constitution. It's the old constitution. And it's an old uh, constitutional court decision. Andras. Thank you very much. So just a quick reactions. Actually, I didn't receive any question, unfortunately. So I tried to react to the questions uh, the audience posed to, to the others. Uh, first, about uh, the situation, right to life, abortion, and so on. So, basically, the, the text changed slightly from what was before, so in two until 2010, between 1989 and 2010. The text slightly changed, but as a matter of fact, constitutionally, it didn't change much, because what happened is that the case law of the Constitutional Court has been codified. So the Constitutional Court already said in the 90s that the, the fetus doesn't have the right to life, or the right to life doesn't belong to the fetus, but the state should try to protect it as much as possible. Now it's in the, uh, in the text. And uh, also as to, as to the marriage, formerly there was no definition of, of marriage in the Constitution. The Constitution just said, just paragraph 15, that that, uh, that the state protects marriage and family. That's it. And, and the Constitutional Court defined marriage, uh, saying that marriage means uh, marriage between men and, men and women. So what's happened again is that the, the case of the Constitutional Court has been codified. So it's a very interesting question whether it means actually a change you know, if the Constitutional Court understands a certain provision in a way, then I think it already means that, even though if, it, if it's not there like that in the text. But it's a, that's an interesting question of, of, of constitutional theory. I think the fact, the fact that they, it's, it's now codified, uh, it kind of uh, woke up many, many debates which were unnecessary and which, uh, uh, which could have been avoided if these questions, which are very delicate questions, uh, haven't, hadn't been touched. So for these questions, which are so delicate, the best strategy is not to touch them at all and uh, to leave them to, uh, to the Constitutional Court to decide and leave like vague, vague concepts and somehow it will be decided and then, then the new texts couldn't have been uh, 
attacked like it, it's being uh, under under attack now. So I think it wasn't strategic to to touch it at all. Uh, the second that's the that's the that's the ombudsman issue. I mean, formerly there were four ombudsmen or ombudspersons. That's probably the politically correct uh, formulation for ombudspersons, and uh, now there is only one with two uh, vice ombudspersons. There is a kind of main ombudsperson and one for for minority issues, and the other one for uh, for the the rights of uh, of future generations. And I do think that the many ombudsmen, uh, the, 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 the institution of, of many ombudsmen has the problem that the ombudsman actually has it, his or her force, not from actual competencies, normally they don't have competencies. They have their, their force from, from being present in the media. And if there are many small you know, institutions, then it's more difficult to, to present yourself in the media. If there is one, you know, it's, if it's uh, one person, then it comes better through in the media. So I don't think that's a problem, but there is a problem, I think, with the reform of the ombudsman institutions, and that's the fourth uh, ombudsman, that there was an ombudsman for, for data protection. And now there is a separate institution, and uh, basically the, the old uh, uh, ombudsman's mandate has been terminated in the middle of his mandate, and uh, it means that there was an independent institution and this independence is also uh, guaranteed by EU law. And this, in, and this independence has been breached by the fact that the mandate uh, is, uh, is terminated. So I think that's a problem. But the mere fact that from the many you have one, I think that's actually more efficient, even though it sounds paradoxical, because the, the way it, it works, it's through the media and, and it, 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 it comes uh, uh, better across. And the, the last point, is the, the parliamentary representation of, of minorities. I mean, it's a very old issue in Hungary. It's true we don't really have many minorities in Hungary. And now it has been introduced that, that minorities can receive more easily seats in the, in the, in the parliament. And uh, many politicians think that it's a good idea because it protects more minorities. But Actually, I don't really like this institution. The problem is that if you put minorities into the position of an MP, that, that can be very easily a trap uh, position because if the, the situation is too much balanced in the parliament and if two or three minority MPs uh, should decide about the, the future of a government, then whichever side they choose, the other side won't like the minority. So I have doubts. I mean, it sounds very good and uh, uh, maybe the intention is good, but uh, I don't want to doubt that, but I don't really like that institution. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have to finish. Uh, Zita Gurmai has mentioned uh, uh, briefly that uh, uh, this debate didn't uh, take place uh, in Hungary, at least not in this form. So I really would like to thank uh, all the participants uh, uh, on both sides for pro and or, or, or against uh, this constitution to participate in this debate and thank you very much for coming. <laughs>